Right. So the brief part is really we have, as we know, in, in I'm going to give you with the, with the Kabbalistic background, okay? The Kabbalistic background is we know that we have four worlds. You have to listen to me a little bit here. The Atsilut, the closest thing to the aura of the Ein Sof. Then we have Bria, which is creation. Then we have Yitzira, formation. And then you'll have Asiya, making. Four different dimensions that we have in our tradition. Now, we also have the aspect of the letters. You have Ta'amim, which is the cantillation. The cantillation is uh, an expression of the world of Atsilut, the highest. Cantillation mark. Ma, pa, pashta, right? And then below that is what we call the nukudot, the vowels. Also kind of like just dots and lines and sounds. And then beneath that, let's say corresponding the world of Yitzira formation is the crowns of the letters. And then beneath that is the letters themselves. So the crowns, the way that it is represented, I'll tell you just briefly that we've gone over this in different cla previous classes about the the shvira de kaling, the shattering of the vessels. There were seven vessels that were destroyed. And those seven vessels, when they went down, they needed a life support system in order to give them, keep them a connection. Okay, you following? These vessels got shattered because of too much light and they shattered into the realm of Asiya, which is our realm. But in order to give them, keep them a connection, these crowns of the letters enable them to still maintain a connection to the upper realm, almost like a lifeline, a rope, whatever you would call it in certain senses. And really you'll have seven letters in the Hebrew alphabet that have three crowns. Okay, that's called Shatnes Gates. Those are those letters, Shatnes Gates. Shat is Shin, Tet, Nun, right? Shatnes, Sadi. And then Gates is Gimel and Sadi. Gimel, okay, Shatnes, no, sorry, Zion. Shatnes is with a Zion. And then Gates, those seven letters have three crowns. And then there's an, a, a, another set of letters which only have one crown. Okay, that's uh, Ochel Misaperet. Those letters of Ochel Misaperet. Like I say, there's a lot that goes into it, but basically the crowns are the, are the connection of the letters of the lowest realm to enable them to connect to the higher realms. Make sense, more or less? Yes, I got it. Does it How Rabbi Akiva was able to darish every one of those crowns, tile, tile, halachos, which is like multitude, multitude of laws from those is like a mystery beyond, okay? He was able to actually get to, to derive different laws from those crowns of those letters as now, we do the yeah. crowns also have anything to do with presence of angels well not to my knowledge but everything really is an angel because everything is a force of god's will the force of god's will by definition is an angel okay. and so uh the idea here is of the angel of let's say we'll call it so how it is those crowns are related to the world of Yitzira formation, which is the world of the angels. So, of course, they're going to be related. To get more of in terms of an in-depth of that, that requires a whole other study. But more or less, the interesting thing that you can take away with you, that if you're in a synagogue where they're reading from the Sefer Torah, that's why the actual Sefer Torah does not have any vowels and it does not have any cantillation marks. It's missing cantillation and vowels, the Sefer Torah, the scroll itself. It has the letters and the crowns. That's it. And so the Arizal says that when the Baal HaKore, the person who's reading from the Torah, when he will uh, read, he brings in <clears throat> with his mind and his voice, he brings in the cantillation and the Nekudot from the higher realms into this realm, okay? So that was when he's affecting the Kriya, he's bringing in the cantillation and he's bringing in 
the vowels because he's pronunciation and of course the sound, the melody. So he's actually fusing the energy from the highest cosmic realms into this world. That's why it's very important. You know, they have to have a city has to have a laning, a Kriya Torah three times a week. Really, really, it's four times because of Shabbat on third meal. But basically, it's three times a week. There's a whole nother uh, drush in that, that kind of off topic. But in any case, that's why it's important not to speak in the Kriya Torah. Okay? Because there's energy that's being transmitted from the higher realms. Okay. Let's talk about Pesach a little bit. Okay? Thank you. A little bit of the Seder. By the way, here's your, um, just to let you know, next week, we will, next Three weeks, I think we won't be having any classes because I'm just too busy in Passover preparations. I'm sorry. Uh, so I will send a uh, message out, an email of when the next classes will be. I think it's the 24th of April. So we're going to be off for quite a few weeks now. Okay. But we're going to talk about the Seder and the Passover Seder and how to make it the most effective possible Seder that you can have, the most experiential Seder, the most deeply moving Seder. Okay. We always want to get that. Actually, there is a law passed down that says 30 days before a holiday, you have to darish in the laws of the uh, holiday. Whatever holiday it is, 30 days before, is recommended to go over the laws. That's how it's understood simply. The Hasidic masters say, no, no, darish of 30 days before a holiday Darish in the Hilchos, you want to you want to expound, you want to get into the way. In other words, you have to prepare yourself for the energy of the holiday. Doresh meaning specifically even pray. God, this holiday of Passover is coming. Some people, man, with their preparations, I don't know about y'all, but you know, the scrubbing and you know, the cleaning, and it's all part of the process of Passover, even though let's say a simple spring cleaning really is not necessary according to Jewish law, it's still the energy to get rid of old and to usher in new. It's the time of relight, of, re of rebirth almost, a giving of life as it is always has to be in springtime, okay? And they always wanna fix Passover and that's, this, that's essentially why in the Jewish calendar, we also fuse, we're mostly lunar, but we also fuse in the solar calendar as opposed to Ishmael, the Arabs are completely lunar, right? They're, com they're loony, but they're also completely lunar calendar, okay? Um, and the, of course, the Gentiles are completely solar. So the Jewish people need to fuse it because we always have to make sure, like this year we added a month, in order that we have Passover come out in springtime, okay? And so uh, we're gonna go into uh, the energy and, and how to make it as most uplifting as possible with Passover Seder. Now, I always have to um, give you this uh, uh, hakadama, this introduction, because your thoughts are creating energies. And I'm not just saying like, because there's different thoughts, there's thoughts that go in and out of you and you don't really resonate with it. And I'm you're gonna use that term resonate as opposed to thoughts that you really deeply believe in or you wanna hang out with, okay? There's thoughts you wanna hang out with. And because really what it is, is our thoughts, since they create angels, angels are those creative forces which are only wanting to bring that to actuality. So the idea of Seder night, the windows open, the opportunity is there where actually we know the word for Passover. I think we talked about this before. Passover does mean skip. But, and we understand it historically as Hashem skipped over the doors of the Jewish people, right? But it also is a way there, also the way of that we can skip levels. It's like usually you have to go in levels, to go from A to B, to B to C, C to D, but here you can go from A to D. And you can do that with your thoughts and your belief, mostly with your energy, okay? So the energy of this evening propels us to a higher level of spirituality that goes with us the entire year, as we're gonna talk about today, 
actually, really, we need to really get into it, okay? As I spoke a little bit about um, last week, that there's a, um, the, the light of that night, of that day, is like Cinderella going to the ball, okay? It was Hashem, Mamish, opened up a huge amount of influx of energy that was too much for Paro to handle, okay? It came out that his firstborn and all the firstborn of Egypt died. And that amount of light only lasted that day and then it was gone for the, until Shavuot. Shavuot is the wedding. I didn't finish the story, but I'll finish it now. As we know that here is the Cinderella who's the Jewish people and Cinderella is uh, with her stepmother and her stepsisters who basically enslave her. And of course, what there is, there's a special night coming and it's the ball where the prince wants to meet somebody who suits him. And of course, Cinderella can't go to the ball, of course, because she's locked up or whatever have you, you know? And eventually, of course, comes the, uh, the fairy godmother whose name is Moses in this particular uh, comparison, okay? <laughs> I once thought about it, you know? Picture Moses like a Sylvester Stallone beard. Just don't you call me godmother, okay? Okay, so you could just kind of humor me. But anyways, Moses is the one who's going to take the Jewish people and introduce them to the infinite. So he was a time where it was such an elevated state of consciousness that the Jewish people underwent on the night of Passover. And that energy is every single year is awakened. And we have to be vessels to catch those ideas, to catch the concepts, okay? So some chedushim that I learned in the sheets that I passed out to you, okay, that it was never known to me, and I always assumed who wrote the Passover Haggadah. Haggadah, which means telling over. As we know, just a little recap. There are five mitzvahs on this night. Two, three are from the rabbis, okay? Two are from the Torah. Two mitzvahs from the Torah, okay? Two mitzvahs from the Torah, we'll just go, is eating matzah. That's a mitzvah from the Torah. You have to eat a kazayas, an olive size of matzah. And the other mitzvah from the Torah is the uh, telling over of the story of Egypt. That even if you're alone by yourself, you must say it. And it, we're going to talk about why it's so important, Okay. And the other three mitzvahs are from the rabbis are the maror, the four cups of wine, and the challah. Okay, maror, the bitter herb, the four cups of wine, and the challah. Now, the four cups of wine, which I really wanted to get into, but unfortunately, I didn't have time because of other things that were going on. That, why are there four cups of wine, right? So it brings down in the very, uh, in the second uh, parsha of Shmos, where God brings four languages which he's going to bring out the Jewish people, okay? Vahot Sesi, Vahalti, right? And I brought you out, I redeemed you. And there were basically four languages, four terms, and it's not on, on the top of my head right now, okay? That God brought us out with each, so with, and did you know that there was a fifth cup? There is a fifth cup, that's right. The fifth cup is the Heveti, the Heveti. And I brought you to Israel. Like I brought you out of Egypt in these four different experiences. And each cup should have that experience. And God willing, I'll get the, uh, the language and I will, I'll send it to you. Because each one of those cups should be an experience. The idea here is even though I don't know where you're going for passing. Some places they're absolute pandemonium. and Some places are quiet. Okay. And whatever it is, the idea here is what I'm going to tell you is that in between conversation and whatever is going on, and hopefully there's no arguments and fights, of course, God forbid there should be fights, okay? Which, you know, a lot of times, <laughs> you always do that, right? It's always good. You know, it's going to happen, right? So <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Okay? In any case, we, we need to, in between everything, try to just Open up your heart, open up your mind, okay? And to release 
all barriers and in between get a sense and a feeling of what it is like to be really free, okay? And freedom, of course, has a whole spectrum of definitions, okay? But I always go for the main definition, which we're having to be challenged right now, in our world, which is Viktor Frankl's ultimate definition of freedom, okay? And Viktor Frankl, who did logotherapy, he was a Holocaust survivor of psychiatrist doing a study, we turned it, him being in the Holocaust into a study, is that they could take away everything from you, but they can't take away your attitude. See, the idea here is to hook up into your attitude. No matter what, he was broken and beaten and bashed and battered and starving, whatever have you. But he says, they can't take away my attitude. I can still have a positive attitude. And he was, and he was friends with the guards, friends with these people, helping these, helping healing. He was an encouraging, and mostly though, of course, the attitude of there's a purpose for this and we need to teach the world of this. So he turned his experience into a study. So the idea of freedom, where it's no matter what's going on around you, no one can take away your peace of mind except you. No one can take away your attitude except you. And the thoughts, of course, the habitual thoughts that might be in your mind. Anyways, so now let's get into the idea of how we can utilize the Passover Seder, which I do call a 15-step process. That's right. You know, you have the 12 steps, we have 15, right? And they listed here, I believe, actually, um, actually, my, the Haggadah that I got, we didn't list them all at once, which is kind of a shame. Because really, we, what we do is we usually sing them all, and there's a song about Kadesh Urchatz, right? And then there's the 15 steps of washing of the Karpas, Yachatz, which is splitting the matzah, magid. Each one of those is an insight. And you could do your own study. It is an insight for you to go higher and higher levels of emuna. The key is emuna, which is a belief. And I did say this last week, that the idea here is to get to the highest level of emuna. When you open your door for Elijah the prophet, I, if your level of amuna is there, Mashiach comes. How do you like that? What an opportunity. You just got to work on it, right? And that's where I was going to get to that fifth cup, right? The four cups. Remember, I said there's a fifth cup, the Heveti. The Heveti is the fifth cup. Now, the fifth cup is kind of unusual. What do you mean this fifth cup? Rabbi? It's the cup we pour for Elijah at the end of the meal. We pour a cup for Elijah, and then we open the door. That is the fifth cup, right? The final redemption, okay? And this is where we go to, like, who wrote the Haggadah? I was, you know, I always thought it was the men of the Great Assembly. They wrote the Siddur. They wrote the prayer book. Why didn't they? Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi wrote the Masader. He made the order of the Passover Haggadah, okay? which is already giving us some kind of, okay, because we know in the end of days, it's Elijah is an integral part of the final redemption. And here, I saw it in this, uh, some sheets that my wife, she went to a class, some uh, um, unbelievable things, which is the key to what we're trying to peel off and trying to touch in Seder night. Is that, you know, Moshe at the burning bush, it was a seven-day conversation. Were you aware of that? Seven days? How many times can you say the word no? By the way, it's a sign of a Jew. When you're asked to do something, the first thing should come out, no. Okay? Of course. Okay, of course. But no for seven days. What was really going on in the argument when God said, I want you to go take the Jewish people out of Egypt? Moshe wanted Aaron. He was like, Aaron, he's much better. He's eloquent. You, you know, he's more empathetic. I'm truth. I'm come down. I'm hard, hard, cold facts, truth. He's more empathy from the ground up, from the bottom up, more grassroots kind of stuff. Really digs, you know, everybody, you know, he'd be more of a guy. And, you know, Hashem kept saying, no, Moshe, you, you. And then Aaron, Moshe, Aaron, Moshe for seven days, God got angry and says, okay, we'll have the Moshe Aaron plan. 
So Aaron is now is in. Now, the astounding thing was there is a Targum Yonis, which explained what was Moshe really, what was he pushing for Aaron? So, okay, I understand you want to give your brother the cover. But if God says this way, you got to go this way. That's it. And here he's like arguing for seven days. So Targum Yonason says that his intention was really for Pinchas, who was Aaron the Cohen's grandson. Okay. We had in last week's Parsha, where we explained, where we saw Nadav and Avihu. Nadav and Avihu brought a strange fire and got burned and died. Those two fused together into Pinchas. They reincarnated, so to speak, or became an Ebor into a, a Pinchas. Okay. Pinchas, who killed Cosby and Zinmari when he went in. When the Jewish people were going were chasing after those Midianite women, and a plague ensued, and uh, you know, here comes the head of the tribe of Shimon with his with his new girlfriend, who is not a member of the tribe, and uh, you know, going in the tent, and uh, Pinchas came with a spear and jabbed them both, killed them, and stopped the plague. And when he did that, he was infused in him Nadav and Avihu with these unbelievable souls. It happened to be Pinchas died like 400 years later, and he came back as Elijah the prophet. And we know Elijah, right, unbelievable soul, that he was able to actually, didn't die, went up in a chariot, right, of flames, which anybody can give an idea of what that is or what that represents, okay? In any case, the language is he went up in a chariot of flames, and he comes back down in all the generations, and he's in every Brit Mila, and you open the door for him, Seder night, okay? And the interesting thing is you open for him Seder night, right? Uh, really, the idea here is you have to understand, he is a Malach, Elijah the prophet. He can actually manifest in this world as anybody, okay? Bottom line, you never really know, okay? And, but I've heard, I saw in a different safer, and I'm going to give it the, the modern concept, is a transmission. It's a frequency. It's like looking, getting, getting access to a certain website where, I, where all of the information is downloaded. So you're able to access Elijah at that moment if your Amuna is higher. Okay. But getting to the point here, of what Moshe Rabbeinu and, and Pinchas and Eliyahu was there's something very interesting in the Haggadah, which you'll notice, which is it mentions at the very beginning of the Haggadah, it mentions at the beginning that Hashtahacha, here we are now, here, right? And Lashana Haba B'nei Churin, and the next year we will be free men, okay? Oh, sorry. Lashana Hababa Arad Israel. Hashta Avde. Now we are servants. Lashana Hababa Benechori. Next year will be Benechori. So here there's a focus on Lashana Hababa Arad Israel. Next year we're going to be in Israel. And at the end of the final thing, it says Lashana Hababa Yushalayim. Lashana Hababa Arad Israel. Lashana Hababa Yushalayim. It's in the beginning. It's the end. Why do you have to have this? What? It's weird how, why it's in the beginning. Okay, so you have it at the end. Okay, we got it. But why is it the beginning? And that's the whole theme here of why Moshe prayed for Pinchas to be the redeemer of the Jewish people and not himself, is because Elijah, because he understood the theme that the Egyptian exile is the root of all exiles. And, and not only is it the root of all exiles, the redemption of Egypt is also the same thing as the redemption of all the exiles, including our exile now. In other words, the final redemption is all is going to be in the same pattern of the um, sorry, the redemption of Egypt is going to be in the same pattern of the final redemption. Okay. And Moshe Rabbein wanted Elijah in this, some soul dig of Elijah, some root soul, some connection of Eliyahu, because he knows Eliyahu is going to be the end. He says, you want to make the beginning like the end. We want to have that connection. The Shana Habab Ba'ad Israel, 
next year in Israel, next year Jerusalem. You want to have that whole circuit complete, okay? So it kind of, I kind of worked like that because our own da was brought in in the end, okay? It's kind of strange because Elijah was really considered to be a, he went off a lot of times. He was really upset because so many people were falling to idolatry in his age. And he was like, his generation, sorry, he was kind of fed up. Okay, so here comes the line here. and This is why it's so interesting to focus on this night as this line that I brought in the sheets. It is the formation of the future redemption. Think about this. And the verse says in Micah, as the days I brought you out at Egypt, in Egypt, I brought you out of Egypt, I will show you wonders in the next, in the final redemption. In other words, just like the wonders that you saw in going out of Egypt, I will show you in the end of days. So the idea here is now you have to focus on and you have to use your, in, in, your, in your own life as well. And you have to kind of like do a little meditation, say how many wonders that God has done for us. And so many wonders he continues to do for us. And I use the line, miracles upon miracles. Just like then, there were unbelievable miracles. So also, in the end of days, you can expect, expect miracles. Okay? You can open up and expand your mind to know God is going to show us those miracles. And now I know it's a far thing for you to go ahead and stretch your imagination for this one. But you have to try to grasp it. As far as it might be, you have to try it even for a hair's breadth, if you could, hold on, to say, I can't believe we are all in the generation of the final redemption. Can you imagine yourself saying that with 100% energy and resonance as if it is happening right now? Lift yourself up to that level as if, wow, I can't believe it. It's not because of my merit or anything that I did, we did, whatever. It's got to be chesed chino. Just, I'm sorry to say, guys, it's going to be uh, free kindness. It's only out of God's pure loving kindness that we are going to get out. But it doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. You know, you know why? Because this, the effort that we can do is to open up our hearts and open up our mind. Okay? Here's something cute for you, Doc, uh, Dr. Rosenstock. You like, like uh, gematrias and other things. There were two things that we had to do in order to merit going out of Egypt. Okay? There were two, on your bloods, you were redeemed, okay? So the idea here is we had to do two things in order to get out of Egypt. One was we had to do circumcision. That's one blood. And the other blood was we had to do the Corbin Pesach, the Paschal offer, which is also a big risk because it's their God. And we're going to sacrifice it roasted hole in the open and the entire city is going to smell it smell that huge monster barbecue city okay that's what it is imagine the whole jewish quarter just all that smoke going out okay and so the what is a covenant right a covenant in in hebrew is mila mila is the root words of Mila is Mem and Lamed. Mem and Lamed. Mem. So this is an acronym. Go for it. This is so cool. I love this. An acronym. This comes from the Bilvavi. An acronym uh, of two words. Mem stands for Moach, brain. And Lamed stands for lave, heart. Every single thing about the Brit Mila, okay? And specifically, which what I always talk about is to sacrifice the foreskin of our hearts. Our hearts have a foreskin. We pray it all the time in Rosh Hashanah in the days of repentance. I Yom Kippur, remove the Orla. Please circumcise our hearts. Circumcise the foreskin of our hearts. Of course, it's not necessarily a physical foreskin. This is a barrier. 
It's a barrier, okay? Between the mind, the thoughts, and to the lave, the heart. In other words, we always want to use our minds to go ahead and make a, we want to make a bridge all the time. That's what Mila does. Mila, a circumcision, if we'll call it that, is to affect a direct connection from our minds to our hearts, okay? That's Memlamid. That was a cool thing, okay? In any case, we know we learned last week that Egypt is the root of all of the exiles. All the difficult times and situations where God is hidden, or we would call, that means in terms of our history of humanity, are all branches from the pain of the suffering in Egypt extensions don't forget we call egypt the root of all of the exiles so it's the root and everything that's in the root is going to be the branches and every single thing that is extending is part of those branches but on the other side the going out of egypt is also the root of redemption therefore the plagues will also have an expression in the future people do it all the time with the news you know every time there's some red water somewhere they go oh the blood every time there's some locust oh there it is the locust the plague is coming, right? People do that on the news, and maybe it is in tidbits or maybe not, you know? The idea here is like all of those times that Hashem is doing those kind of things, those are really that he's eradicating the evil branches, the evil extensions of those, and healing the world. It's affecting a heal. Okay, we, we, we pray that we should do the right thing and we should believe the right thing. And Hashem should mamish bring the Mashiach and the redemption right now. And if we were doing the right thing, there would be no calamities. Okay. But for some reason, Hashem's got to do a, a wash job. Okay. So the idea here is of this, and this is where it goes. So we saw here so far, we're getting here an idea here of a redemption thing that in our Passover Seder, we're actually not only just, and definitely not, I'm sorry, not only, but sorry, we're not at all just commemorating a historical event. We're bringing the energy of that into the here and now for our own redemption. You hear me? Okay. It's not just a celebration of a past event. God forbid it is not that at all. It is really affecting or being aware of those things in the root and bringing it into our experience in the here and now to affect not only our personal redemption, freedom from our evil inclination and all the stinking thinking that we do, but also as a global redemption for the entire world, that the entire world is free, okay? Free from the evil inclination, free from greed and lust and running after honor and all that negative stuff, free from all negativity. So the plagues at the end are also the idea of cleansing and, and, and uh, eradicating all of the negativity. So the idea here is, as we'll see in the beginning of the Haggad, Rebbe Kifa, Rebbe Tarfon, right? They were all sitting and reclining and talking about, expounding on all of the praises and wonders that God did for them all night until the students came and said, hey, you guys, it's time for the Kriya Shema. So that was under the phrase of, all who increase to tell of the going out of Egypt, it's praiseworthy, okay? And we see that in the actual Haggadah itself as what you're supposed to do is just use that as a springing board, not only to go ahead and you can get into the time and those different 10 plagues and the concepts of those, but even in your own life, how many times did God get you out of a tight spot? Because that's really what the idea of Egypt is. Okay, Egypt is called Egypt. We saw Meitzar Yam. Meitzar Yam means Meitzar, tight, constricted. Yam is C, what we'll call a tight spot. Okay, so everybody has tight spots, but God is the one who gets us out of all of our tight spots. Okay, and the idea is to expound on it. Okay, it's to bring it into the here and now. How many wonders does God do in my life? And just ask yourself that question. During the Seder, you can have it on a little index underneath your plate or something, or you can have it around. Say, you can go around the, the whole Passover Seder. Name a, name a great thing that happened to you this year. It is kind of a new year. You can, uh, what, what wonder? Call a wonder. Where did you see God? 
in your life this past year? Where did you see God this week? Maybe it's too hard, maybe today, to see any God today, okay? But some people can't. My, I'm more than one of them. I'm like, I don't even know what happened in the, this entire week. Okay, so now with all of this due, with all due respect, okay, I have to bring you this because it is so important because it affects our attitude. So the first idea that you have to work to ingest it, which is the idea of how many wonders, how many, so many wonders, so many wonders did God. We have to use our powers of perception. I know you could focus on negative and that, you know, but this is the night where you have to put aside any of that negative focus and you have to focus on the wonders that God has done. He's got you here. You're here. We're crying out loud. Okay. You're here. That's a wonder. The Jewish people are here. That's a wonder. We're still doing stuff. We're still learning to work. What a wonder. And how many more wonders is he going to continue to do for us right here and now? Okay. So the idea, first idea is focus on so many miracles, so many wonders. And you have to learn how to feel it, to connect the mind with the heart, to feel the gratitude and feel God's protection and feel God's care as you're thinking that so many wonders and so many miracles. And now comes the next part, which is a bomb. I took it out of my book because I did a translation of the Kedusha Salim. And he brings it actually on a, on a commentary of when we lift up the matzah and we break the matzah, right? So we break them, we go, what do you say? Halach ma'an, right? Like the only Aramaic words, I think, in the entire, in the entire Haggadah. I'm not sure, pretty sure. Halach ma'an, this is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt and we break it in half. And we take the big part and we put it away and we put the little part back inside with the rest of the other matzahs. And why does we do that? Why do we do that? Simply be saying, because this is the bread of affliction, the way a poor man behaves is he, he always wants to save a little later. Think about this. This is where things shift amazingly, okay? So we break the matzah because we understand that, you know, in the times when a person is poor, that's what he's going to do, okay? But here's a deeper meaning that he says. And here it is in the sheets. I'll read it. Our sages of blessed memory, they said it in Baba Basra, Daf Yud, Ahmed Aleph. In the time that Israel makes the will of God, should be of God, they're called bunny children. In the time that Israel makes, does, does really, it could be, or say, means does, but I put it specifically a translation because it's going to explain everything. But let's just do it the way that most people translate it. In the time that the children of Israel do the will of God, they are called children. In the time that we are not doing the will of God, they are called servants. Listen to those words. When they're doing the will of God, they are called children. When they're not doing the will of God, they're called servants. Big problem. The Kedusha Zalevi asks, it doesn't make sense. The first part makes sense. The second part doesn't make sense. If you're not doing the will of God, you should be called a wicked. Okay? Because you're not doing the will of God. But yet, this is the phrase that, that's handed down, right? It wasn't just some sage who made it up. I'm going to say it came from Sinai. Okay? Because Moshe being handed down from student to Rebbe, Rebbe to student. So the question here is why, if they are not making the will of God, they're called servants, should be called wicked. It appears, listen to this, listen to this. It appears that when man believes with complete faith that the Holy One, blessed be he, he is our father, and the father has pleasure when he bestows goodness to his people, Israel, as it's God's ability to bestow goodness to all of them. Just stop here for a second. The idea here is that we can understand from ourselves. You're sitting there in your study, in your house, your couch, you're doing what, and your kid comes to you and you something. Okay? 
they don't have kids anymore, grandkids, whatever. It's an, and, and, and they want some. And your natural, you have a natural energy within your soul that you want to give the kid. It's just natural. It could be that he asks for something that it's not fitting for him, okay? He's a 14-year-old that wants the keys to the car. No, we just can't do that, okay? Or he's a three-year-old who wants a chainsaw. No, I don't think so, okay? So it could be that he's not fitting for that thing, but there is a natural feeling, desire to give that kid. So let's say he doesn't ask for something that's outside of him. Let's say he asks for candy or sandwich or drink. Your greatest will is to give him whatever it is, okay? And if he wants something even more, a little bit more sophisticated, he wants a safer, he wants a book, he wants, you know, your, you have such great pleasure in giving your, everybody has great pleasure. It's a natural feeling that a parent wants to give a child and when they give them that child, whatever it is, let's say if they earn something good and you give them a lollipop or they, they ate their growing food and you give them the special cake, you love it. It's a natural energy <laughs> that a parent has great pleasure, great pleasure when he gives his kid, great pleasure. God is the same. We don't get it, okay? So when a person believes with complete faith that the Holy and Blessed be he is our Father, our Father. He has pleasure when he bestows kindness, just like any parent. It's a natural inclination, okay? And God's ability, oh, he bestows good to all of the worlds all the time. Unbelievable. That Then that person who will be on that level is not lacking anything. You might ask, what do you mean he's not lacking, Right? Because he knows that his father, if he, you know, when he gives him, he gives him with the greatest love and the greatest pleasure. And even when he asks them and he doesn't get answered right, the person prays to Hashem, he prays to God. But he knows that really, you got to, sorry, you got to go to driver's ed course before you get the car. You have to be 16, you have to get a license. Okay. So, so, or, you know, maybe a play chainsaw for the three-year-old, not a real one, okay? So, in any case, you know, there are certain levels where the person has to develop, okay? But the idea is that he knows deep within that his father wants to give him. His father has great pleasure when he gives him, okay? And so that person, when he is in that mode, that level of consciousness, he is not lacking any. And when that person makes a request for God, that God should have compassion on his people, this seems to be a caveat here, then for certain God will fulfill his request. In other words, you, your heart goes out to every single person. All really our hearts go out to all of humanity. But let's just keep it in the family just for now. That let's say all of the Jewish people. You only, you only want Hashem to have compassion. You only want God to have mercy on every single one of the Jewish people and just elevate them, open up all their hearts for everybody to come close to God. So when you do that, right, of course God wants to give. He desires to give. It's the greatest thing in the world for him. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that attitude before. I don't know if you've ever even heard of such. Okay. And the idea here is we have that actually in a verse in the Torah. The verse in the Torah is Ve Tamim Hashem Elokecha. You will be whole with Hashem your God. Tamim is a great word. The word actually is Tafmem, Tam, Ish Tam, right? Who was an Ish Tam? Uh, so they translate as. Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our forefather, as a simple man, right? Ishtam is translated very loosely as simple, but it means much more than that. Tamimut, the quality of wholeness, means you don't ask, 
questions. You don't need to ask questions. Actually, in the four sons, we've talked about this before. You know, you have the four sons, you have the Tom, you have the, sorry, you have the Chacham, you have the Russia, you have the Tom, and you have the Enu Yodel right? You'll have the, the, the wise man, the wicked, the Tom, you know, who is like, they'll translate it as simple. And then you'll have the guy who doesn't know how to ask. And most people think, oh, the Chacham, he's the good guy. No, really, actually, the Hasidic masters say that Tom is the real man. Okay, the Chacham, he's a Chochum. He's an uber, uber chokham. He's sharpie, right? With his knowledge and his whip zip, you know? In any case, the goal really is to be the top. The goal really is to have the holiness. And you have, you're in such a level of muna, in such a level of connection to the ain so that there are no questions. You don't ask questions because everything comes from God and everything is absolutely good. And this is the idea of being whole with Hashem, your God. With Hashem, your God, right? You will lack nothing. When you're with God, how can you be lacking? God is all there is. Every single thing that you need is already given you. You don't really need anything. You might in your brain think that you need something. But really, if you have it, that's what you need. And when you're whole with God in that relationship, so then what is the idea? That is called a son or child of God, okay? That is measured by that kind of relationship, okay? As he says on the flip side. However, when a person does not believe in this, even if it's like a some degree, listen to me, listen to me. If a person doesn't believe that God's will is to only to bestow and he has pleasure bestowing if you don't if you're not believing to some degree okay that Hashem is our father who loves to give to his child then that person is lacking because why he's not making the will of his creator to bestow upon us good things again I'm going to go back the original phrase that we had in this passage of the wise men was that the person who went Sorry, in the time that Israel makes the will of God, they are called children. That means what? This is going to be amazing here. Buckle your seatbelts, Dorothy, okay? Making the will of God is coming from you. You set the pace for the relationship between you and God. In other words, you get to put the frame on your relationship between you and God. Are you going to frame it in a way that you know he's your loving father and loves to bestow? Or are you not going to do that? Okay? If you do that, you are making the will of the creator to be the father, the, the bestower. Okay? The ultimate loving, giving parent. Okay? So... That's called making the will of the creator. You are making, when B'nai Israel, again, think about this. When the children of Israel are making the will of the creator, then they're called children. That's called making the will of the creator. Okay, you're make, you are doing it. Okay, what's your attitude when you approach Sila? When you're, whenever you're going to open your mouth to talk to, to Hashem, what is your attitude? Do you think that he's going to like going, I don't think so, right? Right? So then what happens? If you don't do that, the rest of the Chazal says, right? So then you're called a servant. You're on, you made, put yourself into a different relationship framework. As now you have reframed the relationship to be what could be father and son or parent and child to master and servant. You have now changed the relationship, okay, because of your attitude, okay? Interesting. It's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. It's all in the power of what we believe. So then, of course, you're going to be lacking. That's called lack, okay? So this is the hint, actually, this is what he says, okay? 
This is the hint to what we call when you break the matz and you go, this is the bread of affliction. The bread of affliction, meaning you're breaking the matzah, you're splitting the matzah, okay? Because why? We say this. Ein aniut ela bedat. All poverty is in the mind. Have you ever heard that before? It's in my book. All poverty, I think so. All poverty is in the mind, meaning it's a headspace. If you're coming from a place where you're not in that feeling, in that relationship, God loves to give to you, then you're in another relation, kind of relationship. You have reframed it, okay? We break the bread to symbolize. Let me just finish. I'll call you in a second. We break the bread to show that this is the bread of affliction. When we break it, we have starting off with a whole matzah to mimut. That's where we want to go. Wholeness. But in Egypt, it became broken. To understand. There's two forms of relationship here. You could be servant to master, and that's the breaking. I'm lacking. I need. Maybe he'll give me. Maybe he doesn't want to give me. And your whole mind is meshed with this kind of, uh, of cognitive dissonance, okay? As opposed to, no, God loves to give to me. I'm so rooted in that. I'm so comfortable in my relationship. With God. And I make mistakes, but I know it'll all work out. And to have that, and when you, and you know that God loves to give you, imagine yourself being in that relationship. Then you are called a child, okay? It is so dynamic, okay? Just to read off this. And this is the hint to when we say bread of affliction, which is the bread of, of the poor. When Israel was in Egypt, they were in the aspect of smallness, small-mindedness. And this is why we call the bread of affliction. That's why we break the matzah. On this, our wise men of blessed memory have said, the bread of affliction, the way of a poor person is to divide and partake of a slice. A slice meaning a prusa, which is also the same word for lacking. A mentality of lack versus a mentality of not lack. Okay, we're going to stop here. What but I know versus a mentality of lack? Okay. Rabbi. Yes. yes. Um, in the Torah, Moses is always called a servant of God. Why isn't Moses called a child of God? You're so right. You're so good. I think you've asked that before. I think oh, we really? went over before. Um, you know why we call him a servant? Is because actually his idea was, I've heard this before, he was really so into the Jewish people. And I'm going to give you a little word here. You know, when, when we were at Mount Sinai and we said, we'll do and we will hear, we got two crowns. Angels came down from heaven and gave each one of us, we had two crowns. And what happens is, of course, when we sin with the sin of the golden calf, those crowns were taken from us. But on Shabbos, on the davening, in the morning, in the silent prayer, we say that Moshe, who was the servant, He's the servant in the way that he restores those crowns to us. So it's not necessarily a servant, believe it or not, even though he's Rabban Shel Israel, and I'm going on a limb. But he actually is into serving the Jewish people. So it could be that the servant of Hashem or is, is really could be the aspect of him being so dedicated to the Jewish people. I'm just saying that. But then again, uh, anybody else have any other answers? You can always just say he was a servant as well as a son, okay? But it's a good question in any case, okay? I don't know if I did justice. Anybody else questions? Yes. I have a couple of questions. Uh, back with Moses, when he was arguing with, with God for seven days, where was that relationship in time to the burning bush? Was that at the burning bush? Or at the burning bush. Okay, when he recognized that when he approached the burning bush and Hashem, pardon, when he recognized God as part of the burning bush, right? Right. Okay. So, all right. So that was the seven days. And uh, when is your book coming out? You know, we want to help sponsor you. I'm still editing the first round of editing after Pesach. I'm going to make an announcement that we're making the collection. Okay. And just uh, one yeah. other thing: What's the city you're living in? I know it's not Jerusalem. It's called uh, 
Ramat Beit Shemesh, three words. Or you can call it just Beit Shemesh for short, which means basically house of the sun. And believe me, in the summertime, you feel it. That's just fun. Now, when you're, you're like, just, ah! just picking up, uh, just uh, picking up uh, what you were just asked. So there are crowns. Tell me again, after the golden calf, we lost our crowns. But the original crowns, everybody got two crowns? Yes, when we said Nasev and Nishma, we will do and we will hear. At Sinai. At Sinai. Everybody got two crowns for not yeah. yeah. And the, really those two crowns were actually freedom from death and freedom from servitude of nations. Two things. They're energies. They're a headspace. Can you imagine? It's just, a, it's, it's just an element of wisdom. If you had the real wisdom, I'm telling you, Rabbi Nachman said, you don't even need food. If you really had the, the real wisdom. You would and not... So and so these crowns are brought back to us on Shabbos by the servant Moses. Yes. And, these, and this has nothing to do with the crowns on letters. No. Okay. Uh, we can work on making a connection, but nothing off the top of my head at the moment. Okay. Okay. And, and what's the name of your book that you're coming out with? Creating Angels. Ah. Uh, <laughs> okay. That fits in all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Creating, yes. angels. creating angels, the kosher thought diet, or I don't know. We're gonna. I like that. Creating angels. around with the sub with the subtitle. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great week. Thank you, Rabbi. Shavuot Tov. Chag Sameach. Shavuot Tov.